As we've seen, there's a huge variety of gels and jellies, and there's even a host of gels inside the humble potato. I'm joined by my friend, flavour specialist, Professor Tony Blake. Hi, Tony. How are you? Hi, Um I've got these, these chips. I wanted to have a, have a little taste, see what you think. These are the famous fat duck chips. Fat duck desiccated <laughs> chips. <laughs> One of the world's leading chemists in food research, there's no one better qualified to give you chapter and verse on the chemistry of starch and gels and their impact on flavour. Mm. You're really forming rather a clever, doing quite a clever piece of physical chemistry because you're turning the outside of the chip into what we call a glassy state. Mm. Now, we normally think of glass as you get in window glass in the windows, but you can make glasses out of lots of different things. And, and in this case, it's a carbohydrate glass. And you've got some spaghetti here. And in fact, when you break spaghetti, as we all know, yeah. it cracks and it's got a nice shiny surface. Now, that is a glass. And the skin on the outside of your chips is also a glass. Now, the thing about glassy materials is that they lock flavours in. And what you've managed to do here is lock a lot of nice fried chip flavour into the glassy outside. When we put food in our mouth, we have an expectation of texture which we relate to flavour. And texture has a dramatic effect on the way we perceive flavour. And I think this is what you're doing very cleverly here, is you're combining both textural changes in the food with flavour release changes in the food, and you're giving that certain extra something when you eat, eat the chips that you make. What I want to do now for you is I'd like to, like to cook some mashed potato. Two different ways. I'd like you to taste the difference between the two, see what you think. See, hopefully play around with some of the starch in each one and, well, you tell me. OK. So here's the bad mash. And here's the good mash. Can Tony tell the difference? OK, Tony. So here are two warm gels. Take your pick. OK, Esther, <laughs> let, let's, let's have a go at them. Yep. I like that one personally. I, I'm not quite sure about the other one. Let's try the other one. Mm. Yeah, Heston's on his way to wallpaper paste. This, this is, this Heston is definitely the one I would go for. Mm. This is nice, it's got a nice granular texture, good flavour. I've got quite a lot more of that, that one if you want it. No, you paper your lounges. So what, which one are you going to go for with your bangers? This one, this one. OK. There you are. Such good gels, there's no need for the mm. traditional extra. Very good. Some ketchup? No ketchup. <laughs> no ketchup. I'm going to show you how we made that good and bad mash that Tony ate the other day. And the secret here is the gels. It's making the gels work for you, not against you. This is really vital, really vital. What we're trying to do is stop the starch from being forced out of the potato and create mayhem ending up with a gluey, wallpaper paste, textured puree that none of us would like. The potatoes for the good mash are given a warm pre-soak at 62 Celsius for half an hour. That locks the starch into all those little granules inside the potato, so it can't leak out and turn your puree into one big, horrible, starchy, gluey gel. I then plunged both lots of potato into pans of salted water and left them to simmer until ready. And now I'm just draining the potatoes, get the excess water off, tip them into a bowl and just pour cold running water over them until they're cold. To puree them, I put the potatoes through a ricer, a very handy gadget just like a large garlic press, only ten times bigger. This destroys far fewer granules than a food processor would so you can puree the potato without releasing so much starch you create a big gluey gel. I'm just ricing them over the bowl of butter, cold butter. Now we're using here 
you don't balk at this. You can reduce this down to 30% if you want to. But really, for really luxuriant puree, 50% of butter's good, and you don't have to do this too often. Just have it as a, have a, have it as a treat. So now I'm stirring the potatoes and butter in. The heat of the potatoes will melt the butter, that's fine. So they're now mixed. Now all we need to do is take a drum sieve, which is, looks a bit like one of those gold prospecting sieves, and I'm just pushing the puree through that with a, with a scraper, flat scraper. The beauty with this is once I've passed this through, it can then be stored in the fridge simply reheat it when needed with a little bit of water. A wonderfully smooth, silky texture to it. To finish the good mash, I now whisk in some simmering milk until it's smooth and silky. That is a good gel. I'm now going to make the bad, gluey wallpaper paste that sometimes people pass off as, as mash, but no thanks. For this, I take the potatoes which didn't pre-soak to lock in the starch, and I pour them into the food processor. I've got the same amount of butter. I've just poured the hot potatoes onto the butter, put the lid on, and just process away until pureed. I now add some simmering milk again, but as the potato in this mix wasn't pre-soaked, it's still full of starch and water, so we get a puree that can't be stored and tastes vile. <laughs> I've just made wallpaper paste. Oh boy, that is one bad gel. To learn more about gels and what they can do, I've come to Switzerland. This is Fermanish in Geneva, one of the world's biggest manufacturers of synthetic flavours. I come here whenever I can to catch up on some of the latest research into the science of food and experiment on kitchen chemistry with scientists here. And this is one of my favourite labs in the Food and Flavour Expertise Centre. It's where they study viscosity, the thickness of fluids, and how to stabilise mixes using gels. This is chemist Alan Parker, a world expert in gels. Many of these bottles contain super concentrated gels, enough to make tonnes of the products they're designed for. This one's for a soft drink. <laughs> Don't swig it. <laughs> oh. It's good, isn't it? Yeah. I often come to Alan with practical problems of kitchen chemistry. For example, normally mayonnaise breaks up and separates out as soon as you heat it. So, a challenge for Alan. Could you make mayonnaise that would not split when you heated it up? Well, let's try it, eh? Here on Alan's recommendation, I'm adding some xanthan gum mixed with guar gum to one sample of the mayonnaise. The other sample is free of any gelling agent. Xanthan and guar gum are both composed of long strings of sugar molecules. Will they prevent the mayonnaise from breaking up when we heat it? This is the one with the gum in it. And it's just sitting there like a sort of a poached egg, I think, isn't it? Whereas this one, the pan's actually cooler, quite a bit cooler. That's got no gum, look. And it's That's split. Spreading out and... Yep. Put the oil in there. Hey. Are you convinced? Success. <laughs> I think actually it's a genuine success. <laughs> this time? For once. <laughs> For once, no. So we found you can use a gel to make hot mayonnaise, something I may well incorporate into future menus at my restaurant. And now for something special, crab risotto. Now this dish involves two gels, the first being the risotto and the second being the sheet of passion fruit jelly that separates the risotto from the ice cream, enabling us to put a crab ice cream on top of the risotto but without allowing it to melt too quickly. Now this dish for me was my initial entry into the world of the psychology of flavours. The crab ice cream, being savoury, tastes of crab, but because the brain's telling the palate it's ice cream, you subconsciously 
are prepared for sugar and you almost pick up a sweetness that isn't there. It's quite fascinating and it's a really good way of playing with the senses. First, pour the crab stock into the pan. When simmering, add a portion of half-cooked crab risotto made from toasting superfino rice in olive oil, adding veal marabone, chopped shallots, garlic and white wine. Add the ladle of stock at a time. When this is just about reduced, add another ladle of stock and repeat. Do this about half a dozen times until the rice is cooked. It should have a little resistance in the center of the grain, but no chalkiness. Then add a teaspoon of mascarpone cheese and a handful of rocket. As the risotto nears the end of the cooking process, the sauce thickens as the starches gelatinize and the rice grains are coated with this thickened starch gel. Then, beat in grated parmesan and butter. As the fat melts, the starch gel helps the fat disperse. This further thickens the sauce and prevents the fat from separating. Then add white crab meat, followed by the crab velouté, a thick aromatic sauce made from brown crab meat and stock, plus alcohol and cream, reduced down. Add some shredded basil, finish with a few drops of lemon and orange juice, oil, salt and black pepper. Leave the risotto to thicken for a couple of minutes. Now to plate up. Beside the drag of powdered red pepper, a spoonful of risotto, the dish's first gel. Add a thin red line of red pepper reduction. Cover the risotto with a sheet of passion fruit jelly, the second gel. This only melts above 80 Celsius and protects the ice cream from the heat of the risotto. Then, the crab ice cream. A few drops of crab oil. And there you are, crab risotto.